Uh, I'm Sal Roselli, uh, you know, very privileged to be the president of the National <laughs> Union of Healthcare Workers. And I want to welcome you here to this uh, extraordinary event, which includes mental health leaders from both the national and statewide levels, along with therapists, patients, and family members from our state's largest HMO, Kaiser Permanente. We stand at a critical moment in the struggle for mental health care. Although we've made progress against stigma in recent years, today we face worsening problems that literally threaten the lives of thousands of people across the country. Diagnoses of major depression are up 33% in the U.S. since 2013 and are rising especially fast among youth. The rate of suicide in the U.S. has increased 33% since 1999. Addiction and opioid epidemic are taking a massive toll with more than 42,000 overdose deaths in 2016, a 30% increase from the prior year. Average life expectancy in the U.S. has actually declined for three years in a row, which is unheard of in an advanced economy. This is driven in large part by deaths from substance abuse and suicide. And those of us in this room face an additional challenge because we also have to battle our state's largest HMO, Kaiser Permanente, which has decided to bury its head in the sand and refuse to dedicate the resources needed to address our society's mental health needs. This afternoon, we'll hear from more than a half dozen therapists, patients, and family members about their direct experiences with Kaiser's mental health services. We'll also hear from former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, the author of the Federal Mental Health Parity Act and one of our nation's leading mental health advocates. And we'll hear from the chairman of the California Senate Select Committee on Mental Health, Senator Jim Bell. A moment ago, I described the great challenges we face, but friends, it's also a great opportunity. If we can turn around Kaiser, we can bring changes that will affect the rest of our healthcare industry across the nation. I'm happy we're here together, clinicians, nurses, patients, family members, and national and statewide leaders like Patrick and Jim. This is the sort of coalition that we will need to win our fight for mental health care parity and turn Kaiser around. Unfortunately, Senator Jim Bell can't stay with us this afternoon, so he's going to lead off. And please hear that he is perhaps the leading legislature here in California on mental health. He's the chair of the Senate Select Committee on Mental Health and the chair of the Mental Health Caucus of California's legislature. He also serves on the Senate Health Committee, and last week he introduced new legislation to strengthen California's Mental Health Parity Act. And Senator Jim Bell is a longtime friend of our union. Please welcome Jim Bell. Thank you, Sal. Um, well, I'm glad you're sitting down. I know some of you have sore feet, right? <laughs> so uh, keep up the good work and uh, the cause, because I want to send a message from many of my colleagues in the um, Mental Health Caucus and the Senate Select Committee on Mental Health that we're behind you and we want you to be successful. We want you to be successful for yourselves, what you're doing, and you as people, but also for the people of California. This is a signature movement that has to happen for California. Now, where are we in California? Well, we got a governor that just got elected 63%, and he says for health care for all. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. We. Um, I was just telling Patrick, we got rid of seven Republican members of Congress and replaced them with Democrats. So, with the help of your organization. So, uh, we also got rid of uh, two uh, state senators, Republican, replaced them with Democrats. And now we have way over a two thirds vote in both the Assembly and the State Senate. And so we had some electoral victories, right? 
Now, why did, why did uh, some of these districts, why did some of these districts actually were successful in California? Is because the candidates running in these districts actually campaign on one major issue, and that was health care. Health care for all. People wanted to hear that they were going to elect somebody who was going to stand up for them and be for health care for all. So I, 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 what I'm going to say now is in the context of that. We have a victory in California. Now, and, um, and we're licking our chops for 2020 when Donald Trump is running for re-election, aren't we? I mean, we're, you know, this is going to be an uh, uh, election that we're going to be victorious again and again and again. We'll probably have even more victories. So I think that... Uh, Having the health care uh, issue and the mental health care, why it, Sal talked about why it's important. We have a suicide rates that have increased by a third since 2013. People's lives are devastated by wild, these wildfires. That's causing a major mental health issue. And less than a quarter youth in California actually get the mental health care they need. Only a quarter of them. And so we must broaden access. We must broaden access in California and have more mental health workers. So, you know, I just don't understand why Kaiser's taking the illogical position that they have enough mental health workers. Does, it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. And then paying them adequately is another part of it. Adequate pay means that you can have better recruitment options for people that were traditionally underpaid. Traditionally underpaid. So Kaiser, the message to Kaiser is the people want to see more emphasis on the mental health part of your health care. And we also think that if you emphasize mental health in your health care system, your health care system will cost less because people's results in the other areas of health care will be much, much better. Don't you know that, Kaiser? You've done a lot of studies on this. So one of the, one of the things we're in solidarity, um, I, I, I opened a paper this morning in San Jose, and there was this, on the back of the front page, there's this all full page ad full page ad from Kaiser, okay, in San Jose, okay? So I'm gonna to respond to some of the stuff that was said at that time. Now, in response to the strike, the Kaiser, you probably heard this stuff before. The Kaiser's nurse executive stated, it's particularly disheartening that the union leadership would call a strike during the holiday season. Okay, now what I think is disheartening is that three of the, of the four contracts expired back in September. Yeah. You could have been working on it. You should have, you should have dealt with this. And, and here we are three months later without a contract. And now another thing I think is disheartening is that thousands of patients with health insurance, that actually paying health insurance, are going without much needed mental health services. I think that's... Uh, that's wrong. And what I think is disheartening is that the ex excessive patient to provider ratios, and that prevents effective treatment. That, that is crazy. It's not worth it. You are the experts and the true advocates for our patients. And because of your efforts, we have a better picture of how the patient's needs are under addressed. Now, in addition to improving our working conditions for you and your colleagues, and improving mental health outcomes for patients as a state, or the whole state, we must ensure that mental health services are treated on equal playing field with the physical ailments. And that's why we've introduced SB 11. Now you can, I told some of you when I was talking to you earlier, look it up, SB 11. SB 11 is the California Mental Health Parity Act that was introduced two weeks ago by myself and several of my colleagues. 
And we are gonna try to have a parity legislation this year. And we tried in the past, we tried in the past, like Arnold Schwarzenegger vetoed the parity bill twice. We got it through assembly, he vetoed it twice due to the insurance company's uh, opposition. In 2013, uh, we, had, we got the SB 22 approved to tighten California's parity laws during the Medi-Cal expansion. Now, I think it's about time we have Medi-Cal have parity too, don't you? Medicare, Medi-Cal, uh, Medicaid should all be equal parity throughout the United States and throughout California. However, we have to work on this SB 11. Uh, it was inspired by the Kennedy Forum. I'll just give credit to Patrick and the Kennedy Forum, a national organization. And it would prohibit a health plan from imposing, and he'll talk about this because he's the expert, imposing prior authorization requirements before getting coverage for uh, FDA-approved medications. The bill strengthens reporting requirements by health insurers and state agencies to ensure mental health and substance abuse disorder services are fully covered. You know, um, people ask me where, I, where I've gone this, this uh, during the break since the session adjourned in the beginning of September. Well, of course, I was out campaigning, but a lot of people traveled all over the place. You know, I've been to 25 prisons. And you, you know, I've been to 25 prisons, talked to the people in the prison. You know something? Did you read in the paper today, or the last few days? There are people dying in death row in California of opiate addiction. They're, they're, they're overdosing in death row, in death row. So there, there are hundreds and perhaps thousands of people that are addicted in the California prison system. Now, what kind of health care program do you have in the prison and outside the prison that allows that to happen? So I think we have to ensure that mental health benefit treatment limitations are no more restrictive than the physical health care. I'm, I'm uh, proposing that in SB 11. Now, it's not going to be easy to get this bill through. That's why I need support with providers, the uh, labor organizations like yours. Patrick is going to help us. We're going to have all the people that have experiences in mental health uh, issues, like me, my family. My, uh, my, uh, a lot of people know this because I've talked about it. My um, stepson is developmentally disabled. He has the schizoid affective disorder. And uh, Pat and I, my wife, are 35 years, you know, pretty good, you know. She's waiting for me at home. Uh, I've got to go to dinner with her tonight, so i got to leave early. Um, you know, that's part of the good deal when you're a politician. You've got to have some compromises in your, in your marriage, right? That's right. That's right. He knows. So he's, he's a happy, happy guy. Uh, so so I, I, I think that... Uh, Pat is uh, very, we're active in NAMI. We've done the peer-to-peer -peer training, the family-to-family -family training. I think we ought to have more of that. Uh, we have other mental health ed, uh, legislation. The SB 10 will establish the standards for peers who live with the experience of mental illness and substance abuse disorder. So this is the peer certification bill that Governor Jerry Brown vetoed last year. We're reintroducing the bill. You support it 100%. You know that if we have these peers involved in the mental health supporting people, uh, like, like my wife and I, in terms of our family and, and other people that have mental health issues, helping other people, that's a good thing. We want them involved. We want the, the whole community should be involved. How can we reduce stigma unless we talk about it and talk to each other? How can we reduce stigma? So I think this is very important. It would establish a statewide uniformity across the state for peer support services. Now, another thing, uh, the governor vetoed the bill last year. I don't know why. We can't figure it out. We don't care anymore because he's not governor anymore. We got a new governor, right? So nothing. We're just going to reintroduce the bill. Start over. Yeah, that's what you do. Isn't it tough to do mental health work? 
What's tough for me as the chairman of the Mill Health Caucus, I've seen more. The bills in Mill Health in California have been vetoed three times as much as uh, other bills. Did you know that? It's tough to get the bills through. There's no like mental health patient political action committee that has tons of money like the insurance companies, right? They don't have like a big, huge Gucci shoes and Armani suit lobbyist that's running around lobbying and trying to get people to water down all these legislations that we're trying to get passed. You know, they come, they come around, they're wearing their 4,000, you know, they, they wear their Armani suits, uh, Giorgio Armani, and I wear the George Foreman, you know. <laughs> you know, the big and tall, the big, didn't you have the big, I have nine brothers and sisters, okay, and I'm the, I'm the middle size one, okay. So, so we, all, we all go to, we get the discount, the group discount, you know. Uh, so that is um, the last bill I want to mention. And this is important. We're introducing SB 12. SB 12 would establish at least 100 youth mental health drop-in centers across the state. We want you to run some of them. Some of you are experts in this. This would provide innovative model. We rely on me medical professionals and peers to deliver mental health services to youth, regardless of whether or not they're insured, uninsured, or, or underinsured. They can walk right in and immediately get mental health services right off the spot. You know, um, this, this model is based on the Heads Headspace program in Australia. You look that one up. It's kind of an interesting program. They decided in Australia just to do a national youth drop-in program because they had this huge suicidal program. Sound familiar, folks? Sound familiar? So they, they established this national youth drop-in center. They realized they can't use the word mental health, so they call it Headspace. So the kids are very involved. They have peer groups. They have professionals, the counseling. They do outreach programs, uh, all different levels of care. And um, it's having a great effect on the suicide rate and on the mental health and on, guess what, on their grades. Because a, a kid that has less mental health problems gets better grades, right? Their grades go up. So California, we're all complaining about, oh, the grades aren't going up. Well, maybe if you had some of these youth drop-in centers and programs into schools and, and programs to help kids that deal with trauma in their lives, because we have a lot of, you know, the schools happen to be, be um, brown and black that have lower grade. And then people say, why is that? Well, sometimes if you don't, if you had all these social and poverty issues, uh, your grades aren't going to be a good. But well, maybe if we had a good support network with a good mental health system and other, other support systems, we would, we would see the kids' grades go better, right? So I think that's uh, very important. In British Columbia, they did this, and they call it the foundry. You can look, I, I'm saying this so you guys can look them up and check them out. But this foundry idea, and the kids decide the name in British Columbia. They had like a, a plebiscite and let them vote on what they wanted to call it. They call it the foundry, you know, like forming things, you know. Somehow they, they thought... That would be, and we're establishing two of these centers, drop-in centers in Santa Clara County, and we're having the Stanford School of Medicine Psychiatry help us uh, design and build these centers. And we got a grant from the Mill Health Services Act Commission, commission uh, the Prop 63, which I'm a member of. I'm the Senate appointee to that. So I think, I think in summary that you know, you're a thin red line wearing the red, including the nurses. Okay, your nurses are helping you, right? We love them. Love those nurses and the public. But you know something? I want to end with this. You know, I, I asked the Senate leadership, I said, they, they do these political surveys and they discuss what the priorities that people have. And I asked them, I said, why don't you do in your survey, find out 
what people think about the mental health stuff, if that's an important issue, okay, in California. And that was before the last election, okay? And they, they go, ah, oh, no, Jim, that's too narrow a subject, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we can't, we got to talk the, the regular uh, stuff on health care, not talk about this. Well, you know what? I said, okay, I'll pay for it. And so they put a question in the survey, and you know what? It was number one. Wow. It was number one. 85% Republicans, Democrats, Independents, they all wanted more mental health services. And I think somebody's going to have to wake up and smell the coffee over at Kaiser. Because if they want to succeed as a business, they should provide more mental health services. And I don't mean having somebody contracted. Contracts don't work because of two things, OK? Contracts don't work because you don't develop that relationship that's better, that's better for the therapeutic environment you want to have with the person. You want to have somebody you can depend on that'll be there, not somebody that's contract. Another thing, you don't need, one thing we found in mental health is you need to have immediate service. You don't need to go, go through some hoops to get referred to some contract, right, that takes time while your condition, your family deteriorates. So in summary, in summary, the state legislators and the governor are very supportive of mental health and very supportive of you who are the providers. Very supportive. Don't underestimate that. And please, tell us what we can do to help you. I will be for you. I will make sure the legislators are for you. And, and we will fight the good fight with you. We're on the lines with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fred Seavey. I'm the research director at the National Union of Healthcare Workers. And I wanted to walk through a quick PowerPoint that will lay out some foundation as far as the kinds of uh, difficulties we're facing here in California and the sorts of practices inside of Kaiser. After this, we're going to move to a panel of uh, both patients, family members, and therapists. So, both Sal and uh, Senator Bell spoke a little bit about some of the national statistics um, with mental health. Here in California, uh, roughly nearly one in six adults in California experiences uh, mental illness in any given year. Um, this March, the California Healthcare Foundation published a study, and uh, they found that the prevalence of major depressive episodes among adolescents increased by 50% since 2013. So roughly one in eight uh, adolescents reported experiencing a major depressive episode during the past year. There's also a huge problem in terms of lack of treatment. 63% um, of adults with a mental illness here in California do not receive any treatment whatsoever. And it's roughly a similar percentage for, for teenagers with depression. Uh, just about one third of teenagers receive treatment. So how does Kaiser fit into this picture? Um, Kaiser is our state's largest HMO. Uh, it has roughly, uh, it's also the largest provider of mental health services in our state. It has about 8.6 million enrollees in our state. So a lot of these things, uh, we would argue, are reflective of, of Kaiser's uh, capacity and its delivery system. So Kaiser, uh, because of its size and prominence in the state, uh, bears responsibility for some of these statistics. So how is, Kaiser's, um, how is Kaiser doing with respect to mental health? Uh, we have a lot of experts in the room, a lot of therapists, family members, patients. But I wanted to turn especially to um, our state's regulator. You know, what do they say about Kaiser's uh, performance? In June of 2013, uh, the Department of Managed Healthcare fined Kaiser $4 million, uh, the second largest fine in its history, for a wide variety of mental health violations, including violations of the California Mental Health Parity Act, uh, timely access regulations, network adequacy, adequacy violations, and this resulted from a 
a complaint that was filed by therapists in the National Union of Healthcare Workers. Um, the, the violations were so severe that the state issued an immediate cease and desist order. They ordered expedited follow-up investigations and then did a series of follow-up inspections. Um, the first of which ha concluded in February 2015. Uh, Kaiser failed that investigation. Investigators went through and did a random uh, sample of 300 patient charts from 11 medical centers and they found that in Northern California, 22% of the patients whose charts they sampled indicated um, excessive appointment wait times for both initial appointments and follow-up appointments. In June of 2017, Kaiser failed yet another inspection. One month later, the Department of Managed Healthcare entered into a settlement agreement with Kaiser that requires Kaiser to go under outside monitoring for up until uh, 2020. Kaiser has to hit a, a series of performance benchmarks. But you know, one thing, uh, looking at this picture that stands out to me, I mean, we're now in 2018, five years after Kaiser was fined for delaying care for thousands, and this was documented in the state's reports, literally thousands of patients were receiving delayed care that violated the, the maximum time frame set out in California law. Kaiser has still not fixed the problem. The other thing that's notable to me is the, the failure of our state's oversight agency. Um, you know, like me, you might have gotten a fix-it ticket by the police at some point. You know, your blinker's not working. You don't have that sticker on your license plate. Kaiser got a fix-it ticket, but it was a big one for failing to give care to thousands of patients. And five years later, they've still not fixed it, and our state oversight agency has not penalized them. They've not held them to account for those violations. Um, so we have a serious problem there. Um, and in addition to this, the, the regulatory track record, uh, patients have, actually, have also joined together and filed two class action lawsuits that are moving their way through the courts. Um, but this is another indication in terms of the failed um, services at Kaiser or the problematic services there. Um, so those, so I wanna turn now to the, um, the problems that the therapists describe inside the clinics. And they're just, there are five of them. You know, the first is understaffed clinics. We did a survey among therapists in California in recent months. 87% of therapists practicing in the psychiatry department reported that their clinics are so understaffed that their patients do not receive timely and clinically appropriate care. Um, so there's a huge problem with the understaffing. Secondly, in, in recent years, uh, Kaiser has added many more enrollees. Um, since 2015, it's almost a million additional enrollees uh, or members here in California. Um, Kaiser will say that oh, we've added hundreds more therapists, but at the same time, they've added many, many more, um, a lot, much larger patient population. So their workforce hasn't expanded at the rate um, of, of, the, uh, of its enrollment growth. And furthermore, many of the new patients, there's a large influx of Medi-Cal enrollees into Kaiser, tend to have higher acuity levels, and it requires uh, much more time, more frequent appointments on the part of therapists. So that's number two. And actually, this is um, just a chart. You know, Kaiser provides our union with statistics on the um, growth of its workforce. So we put um, here the top line, the blue one, is the Kaiser membership. So you can see how it's grown from 2015 to uh, 2018. But this really substantial growth, the bottom line, the one in red, is the, the therapist workforce in Northern California. Um, but as you can see, they're going up sort of together. Kaiser has not solved this historical sort of deficit in terms of staffing levels inside the clinics. Um, so the third um, problem that therapists describe, and, and patients and family members as well, there's excessive appointment wait times. The understaffing inside the clinics forces patients to wait four, six, eight weeks between uh, return treatment appointments. You know, Kaiser has focused um, Regulators first find Kaiser for failing to provide uh, timely initial appointments. So they're kind of teaching to the test. They're um, front-loading their clinical capacity to provide um, more rapid initial appointments. And now those are the appointments where, where the patients receive an initial diagnostic, diagnosis and treatment plan. What follows then are the treatment appointments. It should be a series of treatment appointments attuned to the, the diagnosis of the patients. Um, but those are the ones that are really delayed um, so often our, our therapists speak about this as rapid access to delayed care. Uh, they've front-loaded the uh, 
again, the clinical capacity to focus on the first appointment, but then give delayed care subsequently. So th these aren't only, um, you know, things that we observe. We've actually gotten some um, internal records. Um, these are records that come from a meeting of the Southern California Quality Committee. It's a, a group inside of Kaiser, top um, officials, including the president of the Southern California region, top uh, regulatory officials inside of Kaiser. Um, and again, this is dated October 26 um, of 2018. But this is what they write about their own, um, this is in the San Diego region. Return access for routine psychotherapy is suffering with next appointments available for, in four to six weeks. The severe return access situation is stressing our ability to follow up with urgent cases. Elsewhere in the document, they speak about a backlog of return therapy cases for providers. And elsewhere, talk about, say, return access struggle uh, continues to be a struggle for, for the adult and child uh, psychiatrists. Um, additional position adjustments are needed. The other uh, area that's um, often you know, spoken about by both uh, patients and clinicians are the under-resourced independent contractors. Kaiser, in an attempt to kind of plug the, the holes in its leaky ship, has contracted with Beacon and Magellan, you know, formerly called Value Options, to, um, to provide independent or, or community therapists to deliver therapy appointments. But, but consumers have a huge difficulty getting care uh, many of these uh, community therapists are not adequately reimbursed. They don't want to take the Kaiser patients. And so patients will have to go through this enormous task of phoning therapists, dozens of therapists, to try to find one who is willing to care for them. Um, furthermore, these independent contractors are not integrated into Kaiser's care. They don't access, have access to medical records, and they're not integrated into get the full picture of the patient's uh, health altogether. So it's not integrated and coordinated care. So lastly, the other um, um, thing we see is that Kaiser, again, it's sort of another how to plug the leaking holes in the ship. They're simply speeding up the, the patient assembly line, trying to get the patients to do shorter appointments and therapists to do things faster and faster. So for example, um, it's the, the standard practice in um, psychotherapy for an initial assessment to take about 60 minutes. This is the patient's first appointment where the therapist performs a, a diagnostic, a set of diagnostic questions and arrives at a treatment plan. Kaiser's trying to cut those appointments in half from, from 60 minutes to 30 minutes. And they're wanting to get, you know, to provide to pride the to, you know, care to the greater patient population on the cheap by just speeding up the assembly line. So what are therapist solutions? Um, these are the, the main proposals we have in front of Kaiser. One, we want to in, increase the availability of treatment appointments and therapist schedules. Um, so patients don't have to wait a month or two months for treatment appointments. You know, number two, Kaiser must hire more clinicians. Uh, we've built in, um, in our proposals, a mechanism that would require Kaiser clinics to hire more therapists when they cannot meet uh, access requirements. Number three, we want uh, Kaiser to give therapists the, the latitude to exercise their clinical judgment to provide the type and frequency of care that they deem necessary for their patients. Number four, Kaiser has to fix the problem of recruitment and retention. And the first step to doing that is simply providing therapists with the same pay increases and same benefits that it provides to other Kaiser staff. And then lastly, as far as the, um, these, the uh, outsourced therapists, uh, Kaiser needs to boost its staffing internally so that Patients are, don't have to confront the system uh, requirement to call through dozens of uh, external therapists to try to find one, and also therapists that aren't equipped with medical records and charts and an integrated system of care to provide the best sort of care to their patients. So can Kaiser afford to improve its care? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so in the, since 2016, uh, Kaiser has reported $9.8 billion in profits. Um, as of September 30th, it had about $43 billion in cash and investments on the books. You know, its CEO and its executives are not suffering. Um, last year, Kaiser gave its CEO, Bernard Tyson, a $6 million pay increase, bumped his pay to, to $16 million a year. There are uh, 36 Kaiser executives, at least, who earn more than a million dollars a year. And those top executives receive eight separate retirement plans and pension plans. 
Yes, yeah, so, so nonprofit. Um, so this morning, Kaiser ran a full-page ad in the LA Times, and Senator Bell, um, I guess they ran it in San Jose as well, um, saying that they want to put patients first. We know that they have the resources to do it, um, and that's our, our challenge, is to force them to do what they should have done five years ago. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Vanessa Ko. Vanessa herself is a therapist, trained as a therapist, and worked as in a uh, nonprofit health clinic here in California, in, in Oakland, before joining the NUHW staff, and she'll be leading the next section of the agenda. Thank you all. Uh, I'll be serving as your moderator today. Um, and you'll be hearing from Kaiser patients, family members, and therapists. You'll, have, you'll each have about three to five minutes to talk about your experience. Cool? All right, sweet. Um, so first, I would like to introduce Kathy Ray, who works at Wana Creek Kaiser. Kathy, can you tell us about your work at Kaiser? I understand you're also an adjunct faculty member at Smith College. OK. Um, so I look like I'm a social worker right out of central casting, the broken down kind. Um, but I haven't just, you didn't just find me. I've been working at Kaiser now for almost 23 years, almost 24 years. Um, there are many things that I actually do appreciate about my employer, but I'm here today and I'm showing up and standing up for our patients, just as I hope I have for 23 years now. And I'm here to challenge Kaiser and the upper management to literally start showing up for our patients. Show up and make the changes they need to make for the good of our patients. Show up for our patients with mental health issues and chemical dependency issues. Show up with the resources that we need desperately for treatment. I am here to challenge Kaiser to make a real commitment to mental health parity for a change. Kaiser needs to do more than talk the talk. I am a social, psychiatric social worker in Walnut Creek Kaiser, and I work with kids and families. I have been a steward for 18 years in three different um, unions. I have to say, though, to my fellow clinicians and everybody gathered here, it's only since NUHW has been part of my lingo and my experience of Kaiser that I've really felt support. Support to challenge Kaiser, support to challenge Kaiser for our patients, and to seek the parity that our patients and that we need for our patients. Whether it's ADHD, autism, severe debilitating anxiety, or depression, children, teens, and parents shouldn't have to wait as they frequently do for four to six weeks in some clinics, even eight. As the acuity has increased in the clinics, ironically, the amount of care that we can give has decreased. The period between the patient's appointments have increased so dramatically now that the place and time I hate the most in my appointments is when I have to tell them when their next return appointment is going to be, because I know it's going to be too far out. We need a more robust system. We need more clinicians. We need to prioritize our patients above profits. I regularly hear from the managers at my clinic that it is the patients and their needs that come first. I agree. However, the resources are just not there. With a constant stream of new patients, four to six, and a constant stream every week, we have to continually juggle our patients and their needs. They become more complicated and difficult all the time. When you get somebody in, a teenager who is suicidal and has no resources, but is not yet committed to the plan, we sometimes have to figure out where to put them in our schedule, force booking them into our IPC, which means individual um, paperwork. I don't know what it actually stands for. You guys do. It's our paperwork time is what it means to me. We force book them there, we force book them in our lunches, and then that means that something else is going to suffer. Um, the phone call that we should be making, the outreach that we should be doing, but we're trying to keep that one patient afloat. I have heard it um, said often that that four to eight weeks is what is the norm for us. I would tell you that a long time ago, it hasn't been recently that I was the adjunct faculty member at Smith, but when I was doing research and looking at these things, the, what was required was six weeks weekly appointments for evaluation and beginning to understand what treatment should look like. 
It never, I've never seen a study that supports anything like wait four to eight weeks and come back and see me and then we'll see what we can do. What child and family therapists are, are actually doing is often serial news. We see them, then we wait and we see them again, but no six year old or even teenager can hold us that long in their memory. So we have to rebuild rapport and restart all over again. As I labor with my coworkers, co coworkers this last week, making picket signs for what we were holding out here, I got in a conversation with some child and family IOP clinicians from three different clinics who were working alongside of me as we were stapling picket signs onto the stakes. Some of these colleagues have spent over 15 to 20 years in IOP, intensive outpatient therapists, who, and they've spent 15 to 20 years without even losing one teen to suicide. Some are now being asked to change their, perfect, their proven methods in, and shorten the IOP stays where teens and families usually are seen weekly or sometimes two, or two times a week plus groups that they're in. They're now being asked to shorten them and step them down to eight weeks, um, an eight week period. Most of them up to this point have done three to six weeks to stabilize these suicidal teens in the darkest times in their lives and help the families get stable. Kaiser's come up with a new pilot system which brings it down to eight weeks, one third the time, and gets them back down to generalists. That would be me, who now has an average of four to six weeks between my appointment times with my, with my um, patients. There's no way that after they get through in eight weeks, they're gonna be stable enough to come down to our, our schedules or put out into some kind of contract <laughs> within Kaiser. I want you to think about this, this is a new pilot system and they have not asked any of the seasoned IOP therapists what they should do or how they should come about this. They haven't asked them to be part of the design. They're doing it from a very weak situation and they're trying to keep them out of it. It doesn't seem like it's about stabilization of patients. It seems like it's about a cost containment, not suicide containment. So I sat on a bus yesterday. The last thing I think is important to me is a, somebody who supervised um, interns for so long and have seen some of my interns go on to be clinicians in, in Kaiser. I was sitting next to a, a clinician who has worked for Kaiser for about three to five years, let's say. The biggest attrition rate in Kaiser right now with clinicians is about three to five years. And he was talking about the visits and the pressures from schedule management, which has been upon us now for about five years. And he was talking about how exhausted he was and what he was questioning as a child and family therapist and a generalist, how he was gonna stay there. Basically, he was saying that he often works through his lunches. Sometimes he makes telephone calls and hopes when he's eating that if they answer, he, will, he won't get lunch. If they don't answer, he will. <laughs> but it, he's feeling so stressed that he doesn't think he can keep up the pace. Kaiser is saying that our compensation isn't enough. There isn't enough money for, for us. That's why we're out on strike. They couldn't be more wrong. Oh, don't get me wrong. I would love to have more money. Um, I'm one of the master's level people that would love to get more money. But that's really not what we're about. We're, for, we're not here for more money. We'd love to have better dental care, better retirement health accounts that they've given to all the other unions, better pensions for, in fact, pensions for the Southern California folks in our, in our place because they lost their pensions in the last contract. We would like to have better funding, but what we're really about, what motivates me to sh show up on these lines is that so many of our patients don't get what they need. So many of our young clinicians, our new clinicians don't get what they need. They're isolated, they're burning out. But most of all, for all of us, we're showing up here for our patients. Like I said, working with kids and families has always been a joy for me. I'm now doing some things that I have really enjoyed, like working with kids that are transgendered and working with their families and working in new ways. And I, I really thank heavens, really, that I get to do this kind of work, but I need more time. We need more support. So as you're thinking about it, when we force book into our schedules and we try and deal with integration of care and we're 
and the attrition is high, child and family team is really struggling to meet the needs of the teens and kids in our, in our clinics. We need more time, we need more, we need more help. So I want, I want to say just in closing that I'm here mainly to challenge Kaiser to show up for our patients. Give us more therapists in order that we might give them true mental health parity. Show up that our patients can be, that we can be there for our patients, meeting their needs, adequately supplying time for them. And show up, show up with honesty this time. Not saying that we are here for any other reason than for our patients. Don't be so just disingenuous with us. Okay, thank you. Excellent. All right, thank you, Kathy. Next up, we're gonna hear from Zulema Blanco. So our ordeal began summer 2014 when my son, soon after, after he turned 19, had a psychotic break. I took him to the emergency room. They told me, oh, it's a drug-induced psychosis because he had been smoking marijuana. I was like, yes, I can work with that. Uh, took him home. Six months later, I was like, no, this is not a drug-induced psychosis. So we went back, um, started seeking mental health services, and uh, it took a good eight weeks to even get in to see someone the first time. Um, it's been a hell of a struggle. Um, I try to be patient. I'm not a psychiatric nurse, and mental health was never anywhere in my horizon, not interested at all. So it's been all by force. Um, so we tried, we battled, we begged, pleaded, appointments, had to wait at least four weeks, sometimes eight weeks. Um, he was forced into group therapy. He didn't do well with that. I begged, pleaded for one-on-one um, -on -one therapy. That was like pulling teeth. Um, finally, he started really going out of control. Um, uh, it was December 30th of 2016, and um, after he saw the therapist, he left the office. Um, I found him the next day. He, had, he was wearing a T-shirt that he had worn to his appointment. That was bizarre. Um, I took him straight to UCSF um, because I felt that I just couldn't deal with Kaiser and the lack of care at that point anymore. Um, at that point, he was 51 50 I called, um, left a message on the therapist uh, voicemail. Um, I imagine, you know, she never got back to me. We never heard from anyone at that point because they're so understaffed. And I just wish that, you know, um, Kaiser would definitely hire more therapists, more psychiatrists to provide proper care. Um, our experience at UCSF has been night and day. He has a pre-scheduled weekly appointment, same day, same time, every Monday, 11.30, to see the therapist. We see the psychiatrist um, once a month, pre-scheduled. I don't have to call and beg for an appointment. Whenever I call them, they respond to me immediately within 24 hours. Um, I have had to pay for it out of pocket. Um, I did request a uh, referral um, to UCSF from Kaiser, but of course they denied it. They said they provide the services that uh, we get at UCSF, which is absolutely not true. Our initial intake at UCSF was two hours long, and they absolutely involved the whole family, including my mother. Um, and I didn't have to go through so much HIPAA, red tape stuff um, that we encountered here. Um, it's, it's been hell. It's been a living hell. That's all I can say. Trying to um, get help um, at Kaiser. It, it's just way too long of a wait. Thank you for sharing that. I know that's been incredibly difficult. I really appreciate you sharing that with us today. So next, I'd like to introduce Oh Sun Yu, a case manager who practices at Kaiser Santa Clara and cares for those with severe mental illness. Oh Sun, can you tell us about your experience at Kaiser? 
So I'm currently working in the intensive outpatient program for adult psychiatry. Previous to this, I was working in CDRP for teen, CD, child psychiatry, dual, and um, I was also doing uh, case management for severely uh, pervasive and severe mental illness, um, a caseload for adults. So in the morning, I provide uh, intensive outpatient orientation. Um, in the last seven months that I've been working in our IOP program, I've hospitalized people probably weekly because they're coming in in such a state that they are gravely disabled and actively suicidal. Also, people are being released from the hospital after one day stays for attempted suicides where they've overdosed or done other very difficult things to themselves. After waiting for weeks and weeks to meet with their therapists and their psychiatrists, people with no mental health history are committing suicide and attempting and having active suicidal ideation. This is what Kaiser is doing to our patients currently. And um, I'm currently working with this population. We're meeting with them daily for a two-week time period. And then we release them to meet with their therapists. And I don't know when they do meet with them. Because if anybody is sick, if at any point in time their appointment gets canceled, it disappears into the ether. And they're left with nothing. So then I see these people coming back. These people with no mental health history are coming back into the IOP program two, three, four times a year. Mm -hmm. And this is what the wait time is doing to people with no mental health history. So imagine my population, the people who are pervasively and severe mental illness with schizophrenia, with schizoaffective disorder, who um, are actively decompensating. And these people, even these people have to wait. My next, wait. my next scheduled appointment is January 30th. I don't have any time in my schedule to deal with my patients who are actively, you know, who are actively psychotic. That's their baseline. And this is what Kaiser does with our patients. So not only are we working with very, very severe patients but during the day, but also we're on call. And sometimes we have to be on call all night and then show up again bright and early at 8 a.m. in the morning to provide services back to back to back. Most of my fellow peers don't use the restroom. Most of us don't eat. If we do eat, we have to spit it out to answer the phone because we know if we miss the call, our patients are going to suffer. Thank you. Thank you, Olson. All right, next we have Susan Runyon. Susan lives here in the East Bay and is a longtime Kaiser member. Susan, can you tell us about your experience trying to access neighborhood health services at Kaiser? I'm 71 years old, and I've had um, a struggle with anxiety and depression my whole life, uh, periods of being suicidal and pulling through and uh, not being able to work full time always. Um, hard time getting through school. Anyway, um, and I've been in psychiatric care with Kaiser for over 20 years. Um, and a long time ago, many years ago, I was when I needed individual therapy, it was available. I could meet somebody once a week for a period of time. Uh, but in 2012, when I again needed individual therapy, I was referred to groups like so many people, and I've used groups a lot for support. They're useful, but due to the severity of the issue I was working with, I really needed focused individual attention. Kaiser refused to provide that, so instead I was given a list of free and sliding scale clinics. I ended up hiring a private therapist and um, paying thousands of dollars for that, which wasn't easy. And I'm sure for many, if not most Kaiser patients, it would be out of the question. And then in 2014, I was once again severely depressed and um, I was referred to the agency that was contracting, the outside therapy of value options, now Beacon. They emailed me a list of therapists, state therapists, that I was to call. I called them, nobody's available. Um, I was given another list of eight. Three didn't respond, oh, out of all these 16, three didn't respond, 13 weren't available. Um, another, one therapist told me she might have an opening the following month, and 
another therapist said, well, I might be able to, um, might be able to see a value option client um, because uh, contracted therapists aren't paid adequately. They have just sl occasional slots, I believe, unless they're really desperate for clients or they have a charitable impulse. Um, I did, I was able to get a therapist, outside therapist. It was just a, a fluke, a stroke of luck, um, because she had an opening that following month. But this whole thing was quite time consuming and ordeal. I became more depressed as I uh, struggled with this whole process. Um, I can't imagine how patients who are perhaps less organized or more depressed than I could possibly navigate it, this procedure. I had a friend who recently saw individual therapy and re was referred by Kaiser to Magellan, another agency under contract. Um, she was initially referred to a website, but she can't use a computer, so they did give her a list of names and she went through the same ordeal calling them, they either didn't return the call or weren't available. She's a, uh, kind of given up and reluctantly agreed to go to a group, but isn't happy about it. Um, I was astounded that four years after my initial bad experience, that the same thing is still happening. There's no coordination. The patients are still on their own. I even tried to go online to look on Beacon and Magellan. You have to put a pin in to even get a list of the therapist. I gave up. Um, in 2010, uh, I had cancer, esophageal cancer, and I got great care. It, they spent between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars on my care. It's just absurd that Kaiser is unwilling to spend a fraction of that on my mental health care. The lack of parity is astounding. I want to thank Fred Seavey for providing me and other patients empathy, empathy and practical support when I've called his office. And I'm immensely appreciative of the Kaiser therapists for your professional integrity and active support for the clients you serve, and as well as other union members who are supporting these efforts. I've been on picket lines before and appreciate the sacrifice you're making on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. All right. Now we're gonna hear from Susan Futterman, who joined together with other family members and Kaiser patients to try and hold Kaiser accountable for the access delays and other problems affecting its mental health services. On June 28th, 2012, my husband, Frederick Perito, died by suicide. He had become troubled, manic, depressed, and delusional over a period of just two months, a period during which he did not have the mental health care support and therapy that he so clearly needed. Fred had a psychotic break in late April. After I brought him to their emergency room, Kaiser had him hospitalized and 5150'd at a contracted facility in Vallejo. There, a Kaiser doctor diagnosed him as bipolar one with psychotic features. The Monday following his Friday discharge, I brought him back to Kaiser. At that point, a psychiatric nurse at, Ki at Kaiser's behavioral health care department assigned him to a psychiatrist for medication management and put him in a group that met a two-week group that met four times a week, 
Um, the group was geared, as I understood it, to substance users. Fred didn't use drugs. He considered taking an aspirin akin to shooting up heroin. He, he drank half a glass of wine, maybe three times a week, and that was it. But they still put him in to this substance abuse group. That was his therapy. Fred attended the group each day, but did not feel that it was useful. Neither did I. In addition to finding it profoundly boring, both of us knew it had no relevance to his diagnosis. Both of us lobbied for Fred to be assigned to individual therapy and possibly to be placed in a support group for bipolar, bipolar folks as well. But mostly, we wanted individual therapy. Each time we asked, Kaiser told us that individual therapy was not available, not a part of what Kaiser provided, and that the group Fred attended was the only group available. I insisted, Kaiser refused, seemingly implying that I was pushy and entitled to expect that my, my husband should receive such care. He clearly was entitled to such care. He clearly needed such care. But Fred was only offered what was available regardless of his medical necessity. Following his death, I left my cor corporate job. I went back to school and ultimately became a licensed marriage and family therapist. I did so because my experience with Kaiser persuaded me that the mental health care system had failed my husband. I had no choice but to do what little I could to prevent others from suffering or dying unnecessarily. I know that Kaiser has claimed to improve its practices, perhaps, although I haven't seen it. I do know that even during my short tenure as a, as a therapist, I have spoken with multiple people who Kaiser has failed in much the same way that Kaiser failed my husband and me. It's still happening. Of that, I have no doubt. I'm not talking here about events of the past, but about tragedies that occurred just weeks and months ago. This needs to change. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Song Brown, who, like Susan, has suffered the tremendous loss of a family member. Song, can you tell us about your family's experience and your daughter Elizabeth? Over 30 years ago, when my husband and I got married, we were young and healthy with a relatively healthy lifestyle. Kaiser was one of the main health insurances that were offered to us through our work. Agreeing back then to have a Kaiser as our medical provider was a good idea, since Kaiser promoted preventative medicine as their motto. We have two children born very healthy at Santa Rosa Kaiser. Our routine doctor's visits to Kaiser were mostly mundane but peaceful until 2016. Our beautiful, exceptionally talented daughter, Elizabeth, went to college early at age 15. When she came home at summer break at age 17, she said something was not right and that she needed to see a therapist. We immediately went to Kaiser, and the battle to seek the care she needed began. Towards the end of May 2016 was when we requested an appointment. The first appointment was not until middle of July. She was scheduled to go to St. Catharines at Oxford University for a year-long study abroad program. It was obvious she was not going to get the help she needed from Kaiser. So we searched the rest of summer for a counselor outside the Kaiser in the huge unorganized sea of therapists. 
Despite not getting the care she needed, she really wanted to get back to school and want, went to St. Catherine's. But by Thanksgiving, she needed to come home with a terrible suicidal ideation. From November of 2016, to August of 2017, we started the battle with the Kaiser again. We had very long waits for appointments with a psychiatrist, sometimes over two months. This required that we go outside Kaiser at our own expense. While Elizabeth was seeing an outside network therapist, her Kaiser psychiatrist kept increasing her medications, wanting her to return to IOP. And this is, these are the medications she took during this time. While Elizabeth was seeing an outside network therapist, her Kaiser psychiatrist kept increasing her medications and wanting to her return to IOP over and over again, even though it did not help her. So she dropped out after two rounds of IOP. Kaiser seems focused on pills and group strategy. Elizabeth saw this illness as a serious illness and that she needed to have all the support she can get. While waiting for the effective treatment and battling with a severe depression and anxiety, she wanted to keep normalcy in her daily life. So she got a job at Barnes & Nobles, took a journalism class at UC Berkeley, she co-wrote and co-directed, was a music director and an actor in a play. She volunteered at NAMI to be a speaker by sharing her story with the local high school students in the attempt to lessen the stigma of mental illness. She started, there. She started very hopeful and did everything that was asked of her, including medication regimen. She truly wanted to get better. In February 19, uh, 20, 2017, her outside Kaiser psychotherapist requested that she get DVT. Her therapist and we pushed hard for five months to get that treatment through St. Joseph Health since Kaiser does not offer it. It was a 60-day program and Kaiser offered her 12 days. Her delayed treatment and untimely discharge from this helpful program was tremendously disheartening and counterproductive. Do you think a cancer patient at Kaiser would get one-fifth of the chemotherapy they need to kill the cancer in their body, and the treatment would be delayed? Elizabeth went back to school last fall. Within a week, was hospitalized. I went and stayed with her for about a month, helping her to get the care she needed. The psychiatrist and therapist she saw in Massachusetts concluded that she was misdiagnosed. Three different psychiatrists concurred that she had borderline personality disorder, not bipolar two, as her Kaiser psychiatrist diagnosed. She was hospitalized again just before Thanksgiving, and we brought her home, despite the fact she started getting better treatment in Massachusetts. It was a very difficult decision to come home Immediately, we requested a meeting with her Kaiser psychiatrist to change her medication. A month later, he met her for 20 minutes and did not modify her medication. Moreover, the many other avenues for treatment available in the community were not disclosed and made available to us. Thank you. Although we told them that Elizabeth had a very severe acute symptoms with the suicide ideation. In reading Elizabeth's journal, this is when her sense of hope was virtually extinguished. On January 10th, 2018, she hung herself. She survived but had a severe anoxic brain injury. And then we were faced with the horrific decision of if she would would want to live in a vegetative state for the rest of her life. On May 18, 2018, she died. About the same time, our daughter was receiving treatment from Kaiser, and outside resource may my husband and business partner's wife was diagnosed with cancer. 
Within hours, a team of specialists were scheduling tests, and within days, treatments were applied and follow-up scheduled. Her cancer is in remission, and her and her family's life can go on after such a horrific scare. scare. I remember speaking with his partner and his wife, tears in their eyes talking about his, their worst fears and how overwhelming it seemed to for them. We too had a terrible fears, but were determined to do whatever it took to help our daughter. Between physical care and mental care, there's no health care parity at Kaiser. Thank you. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Ken Rogers, sorry, a psychologist who practices in South San Francisco, Sacramento, and formerly worked in Santa Clara County for Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who came out today and, who's every, and everybody who's spoken. Um, I wasn't originally supposed to come out today, uh, but I received a, a letter from my employer calling me highly valued, and it um, sent me around the corner, so to speak. Um, I come to talk to, about my experiences being part of the bargaining committee. You know, as clinicians, um, we've been aware of the problems with patient care and the problems with, with mental health parity uh, for, for years. And we're always told the same thing. Well, these are the resources we have. There's nothing else we can do. We can do a couple conversions, but basically this is what you're subjected to. And so the question becomes, why do we bring these things up in bargaining? Why do we fight the employer so much? Why have we fought the employer so much? These are not traditional issues of bargaining. This is not wages, benefits, holidays they don't want to give us, not naming any names. This is unusual for the employer. It's almost like they don't know how to respond to a patient for greater care. They don't know how to respond to staffing problems, recruitment retention, working conditions. Um, a word that I've used a couple times to describe my experience as a clinician is that it's a kind of medical sweatshop of sorts that you come in early, you stay late. I do everything that's been mentioned. I book patients when I don't even work. I, I, you know, I mean, I haven't quite got to the point where I'm seeing them in my house, but you know, it, it, it's, it's completely out of control. And you never get a sense like you're ever catching up. And but I'm, but I'm highly valued. When a thief breaks into your home and steals your possessions, are you highly valued by the thief? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm not thinking about it with the right kind of mind. We've bargained with this employer twice over these issues. Before we bargained, I told them that the services were inadequate. I was ignored. I was on all their committees, their best practices, ACE, whatever, let's make Kaiser great again committees. They, 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 they ignore it. They ignore you. They ignore you. They, oh, yeah, it sounds great, Ken. We're not doing anything, but it sounds great. So you go to bargaining. You tell them they ignore you. We went and, you know, we, we, put together our paper, sent it to the DMHC, they got fined, that resulted in some changes. And, you know, there's some sense, okay, maybe they get it. Maybe they finally understand. They meet with us, they put on a couple of pageants, they're singing and dancing and we're all in love with each other once again. I know, because I was one of the ringleaders. 
And you go back to bargaining, and they do the same thing again. I can't tell you the specifics of bargaining um, for a couple reasons. One, um, I think I'd get in trouble because I'm not supposed to um, expose the guilty. Um, the second is it's horrific. It's such an insult to what you've all suffered here. I, I don't even want to talk about it. It's disgusting for an organization which is so focused on my every move and my every bit of productivity to behave like it does in bargaining. It's an outrage. Oh, but they want more dates. We got plenty of dates. Why aren't you guys meeting for dates? Why are you settling these things with a strike? Why aren't you settling these things at the bargaining table? Let's go back to the bargaining table. Why aren't we doing it at the bargaining table? There are members of the bargaining table here in this audience, and I think you all know why. Because it's a complete waste of time. <sighs> but we're highly valued. You are, you are, you all are, I am. Highly valued. I had an interview this morning. I said, this isn't about bargaining dates. This is about the conviction to close. This is about seriousness. This is about respect. If they want to conclude this, they will. And they don't need months more bargaining to work this out. They just need to will to live up their commitments to the people who suffer from mental health issues as much as they do physical issues. That's all it takes. And f quite frankly, we could do it tonight if they had the will to do so. Thank you. So now we'd like to hear from Congressman Kennedy if there are any thoughts you'd like to share about what we've just heard. Given the statistics that we've heard earlier from, from Sal and from Senator Bell, as they've said, it's hard to believe that we're in the situation we're in now, where an organization that has staked so much of its reputation on being a thought leader in healthcare could be operating in a way that is so antithetical to what they've advocated for or professed that they're about. And it's incredible, just as a politician, that they would do something so self-defeating to their image, and let alone so self-defeating to their economic bottom line, let alone so defeating to their patients. And I suppose that we ought to be making the patients number one, but as I know through politics, you gotta lead where you can get people to see their own interests first. And, and if it coincides with your ultimate aim for greater social justice and good, I don't care how you get there so long as you get there. And it is, again, amazing that uh, they have not seen their own um, interest in health care as a whole really see it come to fruition through their investment in, in mental health and addiction services and in the kind of preventive services that everyone came to know Kaiser as being all about. The, the irony of all ironies is that I, as I travel this country on these issues, I've never seen greater consensus and greater energy around mental health and addiction as I've seen now. And I've been at this for a long time. And so how much sense does it make at a time when the rest of the country is finally beginning to come out of the shadows in addressing these illnesses for the illnesses that we know they are and have been and now have the science to back it up, that in this day and age, they've chose to go backwards as opposed to forwards. 
I don't know who in the world is advising them, but I can tell them that this is a totally unnecessary consequence of some bad advice from somewhere in that organization has them believing that there's a higher value proposition to be had in making it more difficult for their patients to gain an access to care than it is to provide that care. And I don't know what that value position is. What is that proposition that says that it's better for them? You know, I, I believe that um, even though we like to think that our country invariably with time, like people, would garner more wisdom with age. We know that it is not an inevitable fact that just because time elapses that somehow things will inevitably move forward. Things don't automatically move forward. They only move forward when there is political action, and when there is organized action. And I think your strike, when it is happening, is very timely for you and for the people of this state when it comes to getting better care, more timely care, and that kind of uh, access to uh, quality providers that will only provide this care if they are are paid for and reimbursed in the same way they would be paid for and reimbursed if they were providing any other form of health care treatment. I think the election of this new governor, the election of a strong assembly and Senate, means to me Kaiser's in deep trouble. <clears throat> Because there is an opportunity here for you to pass SB 11. And I might add, we've got a couple more amendments in our back pocket that they're not going to like. And by the way, we can now pass, given the majorities that we have in both uh, houses of the State House. And they now are facing a governor who cares about these issues. So you've really kind of got a confluence of events. That's why I just cannot understand who is advising them. Because they are walking down this uh, dangerous path. And I might add, they're the ones that need to be worried, not you. Because... History is coming around to your side, and history is going to abandon their, their side. And I wouldn't worry because all the paid ads that they can put forward and all the scurrilous things that they can say about your leadership, about... Um, the motivations behind what you're trying to do are not going to resonate with a public that knows better. Right. And I don't think your story is going to surprise many people who are Kaiser uh, members because they're already going to know this. And all that your strike is doing is now raising the flag on it and saying, yes, we're now coming out of the shadows. We know this is happening to you too. You know you've got an access problem. We need to deal with it one way or the other. If we need to have the General Assembly pass a law to ensure that this access issue finally, once and for all, is no longer an issue with Kaiser, that they kind of finally get the enforcement on them that they have not gotten, over the intervening five years since they were originally fined $4 million for inadequate care and 
care that couldn't be accessed because there wasn't proper reimbursement for the staff providing that care, and they want to blame the staff who are the lowest paid segment of the healthcare workforce nationwide, our mental health and addiction treatment. Nobody goes into this space to make money. I guarantee that. Nobody goes into this. All they are asking is to be treated with dignity, for their patients to get access to the care as if that care was diabetes, as if that care was cardiovascular disease, as if that care was oncology. That's all we want. Make mental health care and addiction care equal to the rest of the house of medicine. And they can say, oh, well, they're getting paid. So, oh boy, they're getting a lot of money. I can tell you they're not getting paid enough to park the cars of the cardiologists and the oncologists who are serving in that hospital right now. <laughs> who are they kidding? If, if they were paying so much money for these providers, why in the world are they having such trouble getting people to staff the need? And if they say, oh, well, there's not enough providers in the population, then maybe they ought to invest, because they're Kaiser, in the kind of loan repayment programs that would attract a lot more people to provide care and go into the service of treatment for those with mental illness and addiction. So. But I want to thank you all, because this isn't just an issue of Kaiser. It may be Kaiser today, but it's Blue Cross Blue Shield tomorrow. It's any number of health care insurer. And frankly, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, California, doesn't have a perfect track record of disenrolling the sickest of their uh, patient population. And, and we need to address this in a more systemic way. And what I love about what your union is doing is that you're raising the flag on these issues and it is gonna continue whenever the strike is finally called, whenever these issues somehow seem to move onward, you're not gonna move onward. You're now engaged for the long haul. And I am so grateful because our country needs this kind of uh, advocacy more than ever, and, and your union is showing how it can happen and what can be done when people organize. And, and I'm going to take that, that message back, just like Jim Bell was telling you all about those best practices around the world that he's borrowing and trying to put into law here in California. I'm going to go around the United States, and I'm going to say, when we look at advocacy, here's what we're looking at. And NUHW is leading the charge and showing how clinicians need to band together to improve the lot of their patients. So thank you for welcoming me out here to California. Uh, this is a, a tremendous state. Um, it's the state that my uncle, President Kennedy, was elected uh, by. It was the state my uncle Robert Kennedy prevailed uh, in. It was the state that my late father, Senator Edward Kennedy, uh, prevailed in. It's a progressive state, cares about people, and that's ultimately going to be the reason why, um, with your voice being raised, we're going to make sure people finally get the kind of compassion and care that the state has always demanded. Not always per perfectly, but you know, honestly, you've got a lot to be proud of coming from a state that is more progressive than many others. Um, and that that does give you an opportunity to rectify some of these t terrible tragedies and injustices. And, and to uh, all of you who have spoken about your own personal experiences, you are helping to make sure others do not have to go through with those um, the terrible pain that you've had to go through uh, because you've been willing to put your own pain out there and tell a story. It's very painful. It's not something you wish to do, um, but you're going to be helping other people because it's going to allow for the advocates to really um, point to these tragedies and say, can't we do better? And of course, the answer will be always, of course, we can do better. And thank you all for testifying today. All right. So.
you know, we're, we're coming very close to the end of our panel. And so first, um, I just want to share a little something. When I was, when I was 16, um, I was, some of you are like, oh yeah, just yesterday. No, no, no. Uh, that was 16 years ago. Um, I was very depressed. I dropped out of high school and the care that we had was Kaiser. And my mom, as desperate as she was in that time, didn't know what to do, you know, called up Kaiser, and I managed to get weekly appointments to see a therapist, and it saved my life, you know? And so I think all of us, you know, we, we live with the great possibility of what Kaiser care could be, right? And we know that, right, in, in the, in deep in our bones. That's why we fight, you know, because we know what is, right, what's happening to these folks. The, the deep injustices that you all have shared here, they shouldn't have happened. And we know that they don't have to continue happening. And so as we're out on the line this week, I, you know, as our feet get tired and as our voices start to go, I want us to carry all of this with us. I want us to know that each step is for every story that we heard tonight. Um, and so I just want to thank the panelists again for showing such vulnerability, such strength and bravery. We're all so much better because of it. All right, so I'll see you all out on the line. All right.